kind of open discussion. Right. Um, maybe you should set up the sort of panel. Yes. Uh, so the, the idea is now that we're going to open up the discussion uh, for the next whatever it is, 20 minutes or so. And um, the discussion can be on any uh, or all of our four talks, or more broadly about uh, the general topic that we're talking about. So,
famous uh, areas which are classified as pseudoscience, most of them you can make sense of trying to, to do that in a scientific way and then it's perhaps a possibility to get in contact with, with those people because otherwise in just classifying the, the enterprises I think it's not really very fruitful in communication with them. Uh, what you're aiming on is the fact that in fact in, in uh, some of the other authors of the book, there are about 20 uh, chapters or something like that, some of the other authors are interested more in the sociology rather than the philosophy of science, and they get very much into what you're talking about, that is the sort of behavioral patterns as opposed to sort of the epistemic forms. We see that as both of those as part of, of a meaningful um, uh, project here. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive, actually they are enforced because um, uh, the epistemic criteria themselves, as Ben pointed out, to evolve over time, and they partly evolve because, because it's, it's a societal effort, both the scientific one and the pseudo-scientific ones. And these, these are human beings came together and, and agreeing on certain norms, and they changed their behaviors over time. So I think you're absolutely right, but I, but I don't see those as separate, not necessarily as more as, as interactive. Yeah, I think, for, for example, with respect to uh, parasitology, uh, I think even more important than the specific methodological uh, protocol that's, that's, that's followed is, um, it's also a protocol, but even more important than that is what happens when an experiment fails. Uh, because then it's, it's, you, uh, you, you, you have to delve into the, the psychological makeup of the people who, you know, uh, uh, who could try to find, um, for example, a talk explanation for why it failed, or try to um, give it a twist so that it still is turned to a confirmation of the theory. And I think you're exactly right that there's no way to, uh, in which you can restrict yourself purely to the, you know, the, the, um, the formal uh, properties of theory and, and, and keep you know, those separate from psychological and, and the, the cognitive factors of the people who, uh, who are defending the theory. It's ironically, uh, Larry Long in his, uh, his papers on demarcation would not leave any room for that kind of complication because he was actually he would not ironically be an old um, um, uh, well, it's called a positivist in, in, in that regard, because he uh, he said that a theory you know, should be evaluated purely on its own merits, and for example, ad hoc behavior in the face of uh, apparent reputation, that is, a, uh, that, that is a matter of psychology, that is uh, something that we, we as philosophers, when trying to crack the demarcation problem, should not be uh, interested. I think so. He, he's actually um, he's um, uh, how do you say that? You know, he's uh, stacking uh, the problem against uh, demarcation, <coughs> by deciding uh, you know uh, even beforehand that uh, uh, you know by standing up the whole discussion in, in, in terms that are impossible to solve, it's much more complicated. And I agree that we should talk about behavior and about uh, psychological factors as well. Um, because that's what constitutes the whole enterprise, it's not so much parapsychology, you know, even a skeptic can conduct uh, an experiment trying to establish the, the existence of the side, for example, and it can be perfectly okay, it's what happens afterwards, and it's the sociological dynamic of the field that is even more important. We've got one question here, one back there, one in the front, and then we've got more. Um, I just wanted to make, mention, of course, that you've clearly got the idea that um, Larry Lodden is the whipping boy here, uh, in, in this project, uh, we did ask Levin to participate to the book, um, and I have a copy of his email that says I have nothing else to add to the prompt. So, <laughs> so we're covered on that, on that part. So there was a question somewhere over here. Yes. Yes. Uh, I had some difficulties uh, with uh, Sven Over Hansen's uh, talk, and there were two points. The first one was about the deviant doctrine. And the first explanation you gave, uh, but I don't know whether that was really serious, that, that was a deviant doctrine is something that doesn't fulfill the criteria of science, so that sounds a little circular. And the second thing is, um, every scientific doctrine, almost every scientific doctrine, is a deviant doctrine. If you look at Newton, it was a deviant doctrine relative to Cartesianism. If you look at quantum mechanics, it was really a deviant doctrine relative to classical physics, and so on and so forth. So I wonder what sort of job uh, the idea of deviant doctrine, apart from the from, from difficulties of defining it all, rather explicating it. So I don't see what, what sort of job it can do. 
And the second one was, I think you said, but I'm not sure, that the most reliable knowledge in an area, that's scientific. Um, and there you run into the problem uh, that someone else brought up, namely, for instance, chess theory. I mean, this is really the most reliable things. And also, by the way, the most reliable knowledge I gained today of finding back to my hotel. I'm, this is really reliable, what I know now. But I think I'm not a scientist by knowing my way back to the hotel. Okay, uh, first question about deviant doctrine. It's not circular because uh, what I'm aiming at is something that deviates from science. So when I say that pseudoscience has doctrines that deviate from science, I'm not defining science in terms of pseudoscience also. If I did that, it would be circular. I'm not. So therefore, it's not circular. Uh, so what is deviant doctrine now? Deviant doctrine is deviance from science, which I, as I said, I think of as the most reliable knowledge that we have about in a particular area. Uh, and of course, every definition has a problem that they have to define again and again and again the terms that you use to define it and define the terms and so on and so on. But uh, I don't think there is any circularity in saying that pseudoscience is characterized by doctrines that deviate from uh, those of, of, of science. And of course, that also answers the other problem, namely, when I deviate, I mean deviate from science. Uh, Newton did not deviate from science. So, uh, uh, there, and, 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 I mean, there, there is a, a huge um, well known, a uh, very common misunderstanding, which I'm not accusing you of, but people think that uh, people come up with new great scientific ideas were uh, typically regarded as stupid and assumed to assume scientists at the time and so on, and they were not. So, so, it is not, so there's no reason to say that, that these theories, like Newton's and so on, were deviant from science. They were well accepted. Uh, yeah, perhaps, you want yeah, perhaps this is historically false. I mean, if you look at Hooke's and Leibniz's reaction to Newton's, uh, to Newton's introduction of the concept of force, they said that's falling back into the Middle Ages, and it took 50 years until 1740 until the concept Newton's concept of force was uh, accepted, and then people just gave up the problem of explaining what force is. It was deviant, and the best physicists of the time thought it was somehow really deficient at that time. And they might have called it pseudoscience. Hmm? They might have called it pseudoscience. That's oh. right. I'm not so sure of that, but you can. I think well, read the historical literature. It's so it's I mean, you can have, um, you know, uh, some people say that all politicians are crooks, and, and sometimes the charge is justified, and sometimes it isn't, but just because it is sometimes. Uh, you know, the charge was sometimes made and turned out to be not just a present, uh, diminished the, the usefulness of the concept. In that case, maybe the early critics of Newton thought he was deviating from, you know, uh, from established science, but they turned out to be wrong, or, or, or maybe initially they had two arguments, but, you know, they, they were on the wrong side of history. So, maybe, even if you're right, I mean, and this is of course a historical, uh, historical matter, that sometimes the, the concept of pseudoscience was used uh, in, in properly, like rationally to discredit any novel idea, then I, I don't see how this affects the, the, the usefulness of, of the term itself, pseudoscience, just as much mm -hmm. with the crude sample of the I, I to move on. It's, it's an interesting discussion. Every astrologer can use this argument. There's one in the back and one in the front. I also wanted to make clear another, uh, another sort of uh, thing. Again, the book is 20 plus more chapters. We don't all agree on everything. Uh, so, for instance, uh, if, if you join us for drinks later, you will have, you will witness or participate to an interesting discussion between Martin and, and myself about the supernatural stuff that he was talking about. I think he's wrong. But, um, so, so you, you, you don't want to assume that we actually have homogeneous ideas as quote, contributors to this, to this book about uh, the Marcation problem. We all agree that Laden was wrong. That's, that's pretty much all that we have in common. The rest is, uh, is up for grabs. Yes, Mark. There seems to be something sort of common among you, and maybe that's also common with Lab. Um, so his positive proposal was that we should worry about, we should want theories or projects or whatever they are that are epistemically reliable, right? That's sort of his positive approach to dealing with judging theories instead of the honorific science. 
not science. Now, in some of your suggestions, though, it seems that you guys are sort of saying, oh, what we're worried about is good epistemic standards. So Massimo's example of people not believing in evolutionary theory, well, they've better shown that those are epistemically warranted theory. In Carroll's presentation, historical sciences, oh, those are epistemically warranted theories. In, um, in Martin's presentation at the end there, you're interested in the normative question, which sounds like epistemic norms. So, I don't know. It seems that you like Loudon. <laughs> Um, I, I would disagree. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Loudon yeah, wants necessary and sufficient conditions, uh, and these are going to make you, give you a crisp distinction. Uh, it's something's either a science or it's not a science, and I think that we all agree that that kind of distinction is not. Uh, Sorry, right, you all disagree with his negative arguments, but I'm saying you sort of agree with his positive argument that really what we're interested in is epistemic. I, I do agree with that. Well, I do also, but I will go back to the first question in that case, from, from my perspective, which is, yes, we agree with the positive project, except that, in my opinion, there are uh, regularities in that positive project. It's not ad hoc, and it, if you read Ludden's uh, paper, it doesn't seem that that's what he's hinting at. He's simply saying, um, as the first question was, was suggesting, well, you know, we'll look at this and we'll see what happens, we'll look at that and what happens. To me, that is just not sufficient. I mean, that, that, that um, gives you this impression that you're just making up stuff as you go. Um, and I do think there are regularities, just because the regularities are not as sharp as one might want them. Um, that, you know, part of the project is to identify those regularities to, to, and to modify them, to see also how they modify through time, uh, incidentally, which is why then we have the historical component to it. But I mean, I can see your point, but, but I think there's more to both the positive and the negative project there. And, and let me just notice that Loudon uh, rejected historical knowledge yeah. as uh, legitimate scientific knowledge, which I, I find that just baffling because, as I said, you know, we actually have really good information about uh, a lot of historical aspects of uh, our <coughs> We have time for one or two more questions, yes. Um, your question was already asked, okay. Yes. So, so you may 
you look at it negatively and say, well, that's a problem that the standards are changing over time, I see it as a source of a research problem. And yes, they are. Now, along which direction? And, you know, why is it exactly that homeopathy well, may have actually qualified? In my talk, I did say, you know, there are some things that may have shifted back or forth, and they will shift again. Um, uh, you know, that to me is a, is a source of wonder and interest rather than, than a problem, necessarily. And I, I think it's, I think you're right, but I think that's, you said to me, which is an argument why, when doing this um, work as philosophers, we should not uh, be uh, limited to the, the uh, traditional uh, definition of the of usage of the term uh, science, which has, as you mentioned, as a sort of attraction, but look at more important underlying epistemic. Uh, If, I mean, for instance, I often use the example of numismatics that's counted as a uh, science, and philatelic that is not counted as a science. There's really no good reason why there should be such a difference. So we should look for a philosophical distinction that explains that difference because it's for sociological uh, reasons which I mentioned. But also with regard to uh, homeopathy, I, th I don't think that the standards have changed over time. I think they, they did, but not. In the case of uh, homeopathy, it's just a contingent fact of history that when homeopathy was first proposed, that the theories or the practices that we beat with were actually harmful, more harmful. And that, so, it is precisely in virtue of the fact that uh, there was uh, uh, that homeopathy uh, is, um, you know, um, does not work; it cannot um, uh, warrant its uh, its call to claims. That it that we have the impression that it was actually better than its competitors. Uh, but the, chap the, the, the standards themselves didn't change. As soon as we, it's just a, a matter of using the, the traditional practices at the time as a baseline, and then having the impression that homeopathy did better. Uh, as soon as we sorted out that problem, I mean, the, the cause of claim of homeopathy have never been aesthetically, uh, aesthetically warranted, not today and not a century ago. I think with regard to chronology, for example, we have a more uh, a, a, a difficult story. But with homeopathy, I would say this is what, this is very clear that case. It's just. This guys, this is what I'm sorry, we're, we're out of time. Um, uh, thanks very much for, for coming. Uh, we, we need to remind you that there is a reception in uh, 15 minutes. That's the one, uh, one floor down. Thanks very much.